Hello, I am Dr. Eugene Bosch, an archaeologist with long experience working in southeastern New York. The presentation will tell you a little bit about Native American cultures in Queens and surrounding areas. It is brought to you by the Poppenhausen Institute under the tireless leadership of Ms. Susan Brustman. Susan, a longtime advocate of archaeology and Native American culture in College Point, and the Poppenhausen Institute have sponsored many archaeological excavations on the Institute's property, bringing together Boy Scouts and other local volunteers to work with professional archaeologists to better understand its history. To further inform the public about local history, the Institute has also sponsored many free presentations on the prehistory and history of College Point. Both Susan and Poppenhausen Institute are valuable educational and cultural resources benefiting not only College Point, but all of New York City. The current topic will briefly describe past Native American cultures and their lifestyles that were found along Pop, uh, College Point and along Long Island's North Shore over the last 12,000 or more years. The presentation refers to pre-contact period Native Americans. These were the many diverse cultures that inhabited the southeastern New York area prior to the arrival of Europeans in the 1600s. The subsequent uh, period, known as the contact period, refers to the time of those initial meetings and the interactions between local Native Americans and Europeans, generally between 1600 and 1700, a time that proved to be devastating to local Native American cultures. So again, with special thanks to Susan Brustman and the Poppenhausen Institute, I hope you enjoy this presentation. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, this slide just shows you the general area we're going to be talking about today, uh, College Point and adjoining areas of Queens. This image shows a Native American man belonging to the Algonquian culture. It was painted by John White in around 1573, 1575, early on during the contact period. The Algonquian culture was a culture that extended from the North Carolina, southeastern United States area, up the East Coast, uh, through much of New England and into the interior. Um, this individual, uh, although the painting was done along the Chesapeake Bay region, this individual would have been very similar to what Native American men would have looked like during that early contact period in College Point and surrounding areas. Uh, you can see he's um, heavily tattooed and scarified. Uh, that would have conveyed information uh, to other Native Americans, maybe about his clan group, or his moiety or some you know, spiritual uh, ritual effects that he has experienced. Um, so it was, a, it was basically like a, a driver's license card. You looked at him if you were in the same culture and gained a lot of information from him. As you see, he has his hunting bow, his quivers. Uh, there's some turkey feathers in his, he in his head and behind his ears. Uh, those are hunting adaptations. Uh, the feathers also sort of act as a Ray-Ban sunglasses of the day. Um, they would be used while hunting to prevent, protect the eyes from any glare or other sorts of, of visual effects by the outdoor weather. Um, so this individual, again, as I said, would have been very, very similar in appearance to what Native Americans uh, would have looked like in College Point during that period of around 1600 or so. This image of a woman and a child, also done by, uh, by White around the same time as the prior slide, uh, is one of, my more, one of the more interesting slides uh, from an ethno-historical uh, archeological point of view. It shows the, the woman, the female, um, she has stat tattooing and scarification uh, on her, also conveying information. Uh, White has her in a very formalized pose with her arm around her her necklaces, that's sort of a common European conveyance at the time, which she took the liberty to do. Um, but again, she would look very, very similar. Um, she's also holding a pumpkin gourd. 
um, for liquids and other sorts of uh, storage of materials. Uh, the girl too, the little child also uh, tattooed and scarified to a certain extent, but certainly much less than the mother, probably indicating that she has not passed through various uh, important points in her in her life through puberty or other sorts of purposes and points in her life that would have required a scarification. This is interesting to me uh, in many ways as an archaeologist and as an anthropologist is that this was done early on, you know, during that contact period um, between Europeans um, and Native Americans, again, in the Chesapeake Bay area. But the girl, she's holding a doll and, uh, you know, what's the doll look like? The doll is dressed in Elizabethan, uh, you know, kind of clothes. Now, again, it could be a, you know, sort of a, a convent convention that white threw in there. But in either case, it shows that the girl is already being exposed to European influence. So that Native American culture change was occurring that early by the late 1500s. Uh, throughout you know portions of the east coast of the United States, and um, and that eventually uh, came up to the Long Island area where culture change uh, happened fairly dramatically from the period of around 1600 to about 1650. The contact period Native Americans that we just briefly discussed were obviously not the first natives to be found along the North Shore of Long Island or Southeastern New York in general. Uh, those first occupants belong to a culture that's generally referred to as Paleo-Indian. Uh, Paleo-Indian cultures uh, and Paleo-Indians themselves were those individuals and groups that migrated from Siberia over the Bering Strait land bridge to Alaska and then down into the continental United States and expanded eastward. Uh, the Bering Strait land bridge, now underwater, uh, is the sea between Siberia and Alaska. During the last ice age, which we'll talk about, uh, sea levels were lower and there was a land corridor by which migrations could occur. These first Native Americans in the southeastern New York area, the first evidence that we have for them comes from a site uh, known as the Dutchess Quarry Cave, uh, which has some dates going back to about 14,000 years or so ago. Here in the College Point, Long Island area, closer to the New York City area, Native American Paleo-Indian cultures probably arrived around 11,000 to 12,000 uh, years or so ago. Uh, that seems to be what the evidence has. Um, they existed for about three or four thousand years uh, before they changed and a different cultural group appeared, which we will talk about. Paleo-Indians entered the southeastern New York area at the end of the last ice age. To the geologists, this is known as the late Pleistocene period. Uh, they came during the very, very end of the last ice age into the early post ice age or post glacial period, which is known to geologists as the Holocene period. Um, the last ice age uh, reached a maximum in extent from about 20,000 to about 9,000 years or so ago. So you can see Paleo Indians were coming into this area right towards the end of that maximum period. It was a period of um, lower sea levels. So much seawater was trapped in glacial ice that sea levels dropped about 300 feet. So if you went to the Long Island Jones Beach shore uh, 15, 16, 17,000 years ago and looked out, you would have to go another 75 miles before you reached the coastline. Every portion of the coast worldwide that was shallower than about 300 feet was in effect dry land. So it would have been a very different landscape. Um, these early Native Americans, as I said, came into the area. Uh, it was not an area that we would generally have recognized. Not only was the climate slightly different, but the vegetation, um, the land would have been different. It would have been more of a tundra type environment, um, more of a 
northern Canadian uh, type of environment than, uh, than we are used to today. I show you this slide that uh, just gives you an idea when I spoke about the glacial maximum. Um, at its height, the maximum of at between about 20,000 and 18,000 years ago with ice sheets extending over much of southeastern New York, uh, you would have had a mile high uh, glacial ice mass uh, sitting over what is today College Point and elsewhere. Uh, this slide just gives you a general indication of what that means. Uh, the picture shows uh, Hartford today, Hartford, Connecticut, what it would look like with its uh, its large buildings and skyscrapers uh, with a mile high ice sheet or so extending over it. So again, it would have been a very, very different uh, environmental situation than we would be used to. Once the ice started pulling back uh, after about 16 to 18,000 years or so ago, uh, that glacial meltwater had to go somewhere. Um, it tried to work its way down uh, the Hudson Valley through various sort of meltwater channels, uh, but the water frequently got backed up by something called moraines, which are uh, glacial features, sort of like da earthen dam-like features, uh, and, and other sorts of imp impediments to its draining out into the Atlantic Ocean, you know, 75 or 80 miles away. These glacial lakes uh, in the southeastern New York area are Glacial Lake Passaic, which is now part of Morris County, uh, Glacial Lake Hackensack, which covers the Newark and Hackensack Meadowlands, uh, Glacial Lake Hudson, which covers much of present-day Manhattan and the Hudson Valley, extending up to uh, up to the Tappan Zee Bridge area, and uh, for our purposes, Glacial Lake Flushing, which covers much of northern uh, northern Queens and South Bronx. Uh, in the image I show you, you see a little gold uh, star, uh, a little gold arrow that shows approximately the College Point area. The stippled area that you see below the gold star represents the moraine. The moraine, again, is this, represents the southernmost expanse of the last ice sheet. As the ice sheet came down, it moved all sorts of dirt and rock and debris in front of it, just like a bulldozer. And then when it pulled back, it left those, those mounds, long sinuous mounds, showing its southernmost extent. Um, the, in the Brooklyn area, the glacial moraine crosses the Narrows, just south, uh, just north of the uh, of the uh, bridge uh, of the Verrazano Bridge, um, and uh, it includes areas that we know today as Brooklyn Heights, Cobble Hill, um, all of those areas suggesting elevation, all because they are part of that raised glacial moraine. One of the most diagnostic artifacts associated with Paleo-Indian cultures are something referred to as fluted points. There are different types of fluted points. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a Clovis type fluted points, one of the more well-known and um, more common in certain parts of the, of the area. Um, it's associated with Paleo-Indian cultures from about 11,000 BC to about 7,000 BC. Uh, the fluting refers to a thinning of the stem of the projectile point at its base. Uh, you can see the, the flaking on the uppermost three quarters of it, but the bottom most, you don't see that kind of chipping. Uh, it's uh, more of a single flake being taken off. Uh, that flaking or thinning of the, ar of the artifact uh, would have been used for hafting. It helped facilitate hafting, you know, on a on a piece of wood or other uh, other uh, long piece of bone or so that would have been used either as a cutting implement or as a spear stabbing in implement in hunting. Uh, this one Clovis point here with the fluting probably was a, a, a hunting implement with the fluting uh, besides the hafting also used to help facilitate bleeding in animals once an animal uh, was struck by the, the spear. Uh, it would help the blood you know, flow out and let the animal die a little bit more quickly to
to make it easier to uh, to be recovered by Native Americans. Traditionally, since Native American Paleo-Indian cultures had large-scale projectile points, like I just showed you the fluted point examples, traditionally it was uh, thought that they had to hunt large-scale um, Ice Age and post-Ice Age animals that inhabited the area. Um, the more common ones of these are mastodonts and mammoths, but there were also many other different types of now extinct Ice Age mammals. Uh, there's no real evidence here in the Eastern United States of exploitation, killing, hunting of these beasts uh, by Paleo-Indians. Uh, there is evidence for such hunting activities further west, but again, certainly nothing in southeastern New York or, um, or Long Island. Uh, what you see here is an American mastodont. Um, again, he would have been common elephantine uh, type of beast that would have roamed uh, the areas, pine, taiga type of woodlands, uh, open grasslands. Uh, for about um, four or 5,000 years after the end of the last, uh, last glaciation. Um, that such animals were found in Long Island in the vicinity of College Point uh, is known from mastodont remains that have been found in Beasley uh, Pond Park, uh, specifically by the Sutton uh, Playground. Uh, the area there was formerly swamp, uh, Mastodon apparently got stuck in the swamp, died with some of its remains preserved. Uh, there were some teeth, bones, teeth remains, as well as other bone remains associated with the mammoth that were uh, found there uh, when New York City worked on creating uh, the park and playground uh, in, the, in the last century. Um, so you can go to the park today and you can, the playground, and you can see the monument the mastodont that was found there and you know there's probably still parts of him that are are below the uh, the ground in in the region these paleo indian cultures uh, go on to about 7000 or so years uh, bc when cultures change the paleo indian culture disappears for for various reasons um, Archaeologists recognize that once the projectile points change and they're no longer making fluted points, and once the climate starts to become modern, which happens about 5,000 to 6,000 years or so ago, once all those things happen, um, archaeologists recognize the advent of a new cultural period, and that cultural period is generally referred to as the Archaic Period. As I said, during the Archaic period, uh, projectile point styles change. Archaic goes on for a long period of time, thousands and thousands of millennia. And over, the, over that period, the styles of projectile points uh, change, probably having to do with different, uh, different groups of people over time, uh, having different uh, adaptations for hunting and for needs, and possibly also as some sort of identification markers to the particular cultures that they belonged to. During the archaic times, as I said, the climate became essentially modern. Uh, and with that came essentially modern plants and vegetation. And with that essentially modern animals, uh, deer, raccoons, uh, other bears, other sorts of, of mammals that would have been here, uh, you know, even during the colonial period. Uh, one of the things that we found that archaic folks were starting to adapt more and more to, to subsist more and more on, were uh, various types of fruits, nuts, and berries. Um, it's not to say that Paleo-Indians did not subsist on various sorts of vegetation. It's just that much of the stuff that we would consider modern availability did not exist during the Paleo-Indian periods. 
uh, since the environment was much different and those kinds of foodstuffs would not have been available. Some of the foodstuffs that the archaic folks did exploit, which we have found from the archaeological record, are things like um, hickory nuts, which is on the, the right. Um, the center lower area, you find various seeds from various plants uh, that Paleo Indians were exploiting. Uh, on the left, lower left, you find various sorts of berries uh, that they would have been exploiting and preserving for, uh, for eating throughout the year. And on the above left, there would have been uh, walnuts, various types of walnuts that would have been exploited and used. Um, the paleo, the archaic folk had to realize when these kinds of vegetational foodstuffs would have become available so that they could have been in those areas, um, you know, while that stuff was ripening. They would have been in competition with other animals, so they, they would have make sure that they were there to get the bulk of the harvest before it would have taken away. As with the paleo Indians, these archaic folk would have been particularly early on during the Archaic, would have been migratory, uh, gatherer hunters moving around in various areas um, to, uh, to collect various foodstuffs. In addition to the foodstuffs seen in the last slide, Archaic folk also would have exploited a lot of the greenery uh, found today in the area, a lot of the ed uh, edible vegetation that was found in the area. In this one slide, it just shows you one example of such uh, foodstuffs, marsh elder, which when the young shoots come up are, uh, are edible themselves. Um, doesn't mean that um, Paleo-Indian folk weren't eating uh, floral materials also, it's just that for much of their period, um, there was not a large variety of such materials, such foodstuffs that were present. It wasn't until, as we said, the climate became essentially modern and the ecology became essentially modern that archaic folk uh, were able to exploit these foodstuffs. Uh, it's found that once they did start to exploit them, and they had a stable subsistence stuff, sta stable subsistence resources that their populations did increase tremendously over what was in the area when Paleo-Indian cultures were here. The Archaic period goes on to about, uh, oh, about 1000 uh, BC or so, maybe a little bit uh, before that. Um, when archaeologists recognize the advent of a new cultural period, uh, this new cultural period is generally termed the woodland period. Uh, it's divided into early, middle, and late. One of the characteristics and defining attributes of the woodland period is the appearance of ceramic pottery. Uh, prior to that, archaic folk and Paleo-Indian folk uh, would have had uh, fiber baskets and other sorts of carrying containers um, made from wood, maybe made from steatite, uh, a um, soft rock uh, that was found in uh, in the region. Uh, but it's only during the Archaic, the, so it's only with the appearance of the woodland period around 1000 BC or so um, that the use of fire, clay, ceramic pottery appears uh, in the northeastern uh, portion of Queens like that, or actually over much of Long Island. Uh, the earliest pottery probably dates that we know of to about 700 BC, give or take. Uh, these are just some examples of pottery that would have been used by Native Americans. They're obviously fragments. Uh, most of the pots are broken. Uh, these examples that you see here uh, are dated to about 400 to 500 AD uh, to what's known as the Middle Woodland period. Uh, you can see decorations on them on the, on the two um, examples on the top. You see cross hatching up by the rim and then punctates 
uh, underneath that and then an area of smoothing or smooth over cord marking. Uh, these kinds of attributes on the pottery change over time. So archaeologists can use them as a relative dating uh, method. They can, when certain attributes correspond to each other, they know the time period uh, that the things were, uh, were manufactured. One other thing that characterizes the, uh, the woodland period is the advent of agriculture. Um, agriculture in the area probably begins uh, during the early woodland period, during the first uh, 800, up from about 800, 700 BC uh, up to AD 1, uh, when Native Americans were starting to exploit systematically some of the weed seeds that, uh, that we talked about. Um, these would have been various amaranths or kenopods. You can go once the stores open into uh, various organic shops and, and find these weed seeds which are grown commercially now. But uh, Native Americans uh, would have, you know, sown these seeds and then left them alone and came back uh, later on uh, to gather what was, uh, what was the result of their sowing. Um, so it was like these very sorts of what are known as domesticates that early and middle woodland folk in the southeastern New York, Long Island area would have been exploiting. Um, but it was not until about 800 to 900 AD that Native Americans turned to another foodstuff to grow agriculturally, and this was corn or maize. Um, prior to that, maize had not appeared in the New York City area. Uh, it was confined to areas further to the south. Um, there was a mutation in the in the maize that enabled it to grow into a sh in a shorter growing season. So once that happened, uh, the use of maize rapidly expanded um, expanded northward. The appearance of corn and generally uh, the appearance of other domesticates and still fairly good hunting and gathering techniques enable woodland populations to increase over time. And while they were increasing over time, they developed new settlement types, one of which were semi-permanent to permanent villages. Um, prior to this time, Paleo-Indian, Archaic, early middle woodland um, populations would have been much more uh, nomadic, much more uh, moving around the environment based on when various foodstuffs or seasonal variations uh, were occurring. Um, by the late woodland period, again, after about AD 900 to about AD 14, 1500, right before contact, uh, these late woodland folk were living in extended villages. Uh, maybe every 10 or 15 years, they would move the village as local ecology uh, got impacted by their presence. Um, so these larger villages of maybe anywhere from three or 400 to 1,500 people or so, uh, you know, would have moved around uh, over the course of, uh, of a few years. Uh, in addition to these villages, there would have been more satellite camps, hunting camps, gathering camps, travel camps, overnight camps, special exploitation of tool resources, uh, things like that. But the, the main focus would have been some of these villages. And, you know, we have archeological evidence of where some of these villages existed. And even the Dutch, even the Dutch and English recorded some of the presence of these villages, you know, in the early 1600s which probably did have some, uh, some time depth back into the, into the past. These villages wouldn't have been like you would examine, uh, you would imagine today. They would have been more extended types of villages, uh, maybe with uh, houses separated by every, um, you know, a couple hundred, by a hundred yards or so with various sorts of small fields or gardens uh, in between them. These extended types of village areas uh, you know, would have, you know, extended for maybe, a, you know, a quarter mile or half mile or so uh, over the 
the course of a of a fresh water source or a river near a near a confluence. So, um, you know, that seems to be what the archaeological record indicates. And this kind of village pattern, you know, has been termed, as I said, an extended village. Uh, I show you this slide. It just gives you a generalized reconstruction of what some of these house areas would have looked like uh, to the Native Americans living in them. Uh, you can see the hearth, the fire, um, you can see the support pole, some corn hanging from it. You can see a sleeping and storage area, you know, in the background, um, some squash and gourds underneath the um, the, <clears throat> the sleeping area, the, the planking there and opening out into the into the wider wider world with an earthen dirt floor. With that brief synopsis of the culture history of the prehistoric, uh, pre-contact period occupations uh, in the area, I'll, I'll now turn to one of the more well-known and more famous uh, pre-contact sites that are found in the College Point area. And this is the Wilkins site. Um, it, its presence was around 14th Avenue by about 141st Street. Uh, the site was first excavated um, in the late 1930s and 1940s by the noted archaeologist Carlisle Smith. Um, he got a lot of information, a lot of artifacts uh, from the site. Uh, and then there was other excavations done in around 1950. Uh, then in the late 1990s, uh, I worked at, an, at the Wilkins site as the principal um, for another project when New York City came in and wanted to um, redo part of the of the roadway. So before they did that, we did additional archaeology there. The site itself is considered by the New York State Historic Preservation Office, that's NYSHPO that you see on the slide, is considered to be a National Register eligible site meaning that the site is recognized as being one of the, the most important or one of the more important um, resources for history uh, in, uh, in the United States. There are many of these sites, the Wilkins site being, being just one of them. This shows you where the Wilkins site was located uh, based on historic period maps. Uh, these I always find of great interest. Um, this is the 1781 Taylor and Skinner map. The arrow points to approximately where the Wilkins site was located. Um, what you see here is the site is located on a high ground. That's those diagonal lines uh, roughly on both sides of what is now 14th Avenue. Uh, to the south of that, you see an area of wetlands. Um, to the north of that, you see the Long Island Sound or the East River. The Wilkins site from the archaeology that was done there was occupied for a number of thousand years. Uh, the earliest evidence for occupation at the site it goes back about, uh, you know, about seven to eight thousand years during the end of that Paleo-Indian period. There was one fluted point that was found there, which I'll show you in a little, a little bit. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is that when that Paleo-Indian occupation was at the site, there was a period of lower sea levels. So Long Island Sound really wouldn't have been there. Uh, it would just have been a, an East River flowing through what is now the Sound area uh, and a, in a small valley or a fairly large valley as the glaciers melted and sea levels rose, uh, that Long Island Sound area formed and, and inundated what was the valley of the, of the East River. So you can see the site was located in an area that gave them food resource potentials to the north by the valley and the East River, ancestral East River that was in it. And to the south, um, the area of swamp, which would have had its own food resources as well as animal resources that would have been attracted to the swamp and the fresh water that was there.
<clears throat> Here's another map showing where the Wilkins site is located, 1849 Sydney map. Um, again, it basically shows the same situation. It shows the swamp to the south and the Long Island Sound uh, to the north. Again, areas that would have been prime exploitation areas for uh, for native native americans this just shows you an aerial photo of uh, of the site uh, you can see again the swamp to the south of interest is the um <coughs> of interest is that sort of like triangular section of land that juts out into the swamp uh which um you know would have been utilized by Native Americans to access that uh, that environmental area. This is what the site area looks like or did look like uh, about 20 years ago. It's been a little bit modified now, but you can see uh, there was some you know, development, houses put on there, garage put on there, retaining wall, driveway and whatnot. But there was still a fair amount of evidence below uh, the modern surface soils uh, in that location. Uh, there also was some fill, which is soils that were deposited on top of the original ground surface, uh, either when those houses were built or when uh, the adjoining roadways were build, built. And that fill tended to preserve you know, the archaeological records so that when those subfill deposits were exposed you know, by constructing the driveway or constructing the foundations, um, the archaeological site was identified. Found at the Wilkins site were a number of what archaeologists call pit features. These were holes that were dug into the ground and were used by Native Americans either as rough refuse or, or trash pits or as storage pits for various foodstuffs that would then be covered over, you know, with a mat or so, and uh, you know, kept for later later usage. Um, some of these pits are are used as burial areas, also with interments placed in them. Uh, they're quite easy to identify um, when you're excavating and you get down to the yellowish colored soils or sands. Uh, which you see around uh, the areas in uh, in this slide. Uh, you can look by the ruler there and see the yellowish soil there by the ruler and the trowel. Uh, this is the subsoil for the area that was deposited during the end of the last ice age uh, before humans were really in this area. So what the Wilkins people would have done would have been to dig these holes uh, through the, their modern ground surface into the subsoil, and then these holes or pits, you know, would have been used, as I said, either for trash or refuse or for storage of other foodstuffs. Over time, the, the, the refuse and if the food stuff wasn't recollected and decayed, uh, they would have become basically like compost heaps, uh, dark, rich, organic soil with frequently artifacts associated with them, uh, which were then readily identifiable by, uh, by archaeologists. Also at the site, uh, there were a number of hearths uh, that were found there and in other sites in the area. These hearths are fire pits, uh, sh showing that they used fire for warmth, for cooking, for communal activities. Uh, the reason that you can tell that it was a fire pit is the, um, the reddish, pinkish, orangish color of the soil. Uh, if you start to uh, have a fire uh, this coming summer in your backyard and uh, you have a, a roaring blaze going for a, for a period of time, a day or so, and then you let it cool down and then look at the soils underneath it, you'd find that many soil types will have turned that color, orange, yellowish orange, pinkish orange, red. And that all depends on the iron content in the soil, but the fire sort of fixes that iron and you can really tell uh, where the area of burning occurred. 
Uh, this shows you an early uh, feature that was excavated in the late 1930s by Carlisle Smith. Uh, this shows you the, the profile of the feature. Um, it represents a storage pit. Uh, that dark band that you see at the bottom is a band of ash and decayed organic material. You can roughly get the uh, the outlines of the of the pit on the left side where you see it sloping upward and on the right side where you see that darker gray soil sloping upward also so you know that seems to be the boundaries of the pit uh, above the dark uh, before you get to the modern surface <clears throat> you can see some areas of white uh, flakes or uh, areas of white stone these are all artifacts uh, native american artifacts that were discarded into the pit at the time it was uh, it was formed also wilkins uh, was found uh, one native american uh, burial uh, this was in the form of an apparent bundle burial uh, what happens in bundle burials is an individual is interred uh, at a period of time later on, um, they would be disinterred by, you know, their family or some other appropriate person. Uh, any remaining flesh or so on the bones would have been cleaned off and then the bones placed together and placed into some other wrap or bundle and then given a secondary uh, type burial. Um, these kinds of bundle burials occur on and off, on and off, on and off. Uh, from the archaic to the woodland periods of time uh, in terms of um, you know their frequency so it's something archaeologists and ethnohistorians don't know a lot about but certainly it was a hallmark of some of the late woodland cultures in the southeastern New York area also found at the Wilkins site was a range of pottery that spanned from about AD 100 to about AD 1400, 13 to 1400, showing uh, different types of cultures uh, that inhabited the area during that uh, 1400 year or so uh, period. Uh, what you see here are two such sherds. Um, one is a Bowman's Brook stamped ceramic which is seen on the right. Uh, the other is known as Van Cortland punctate stamp, which is seen on the left. Both of these sherds were most frequently made during the period from about 1000 to 1200 AD. Uh, they belong to a larger tradition of ceramics, generally known as the East River tradition of ceramics. One of the more important elements of the Wilkins site that make it a significant National Register eligible site is that it is the type site for the Bowman's Brook phase of ceramics. So what I mean by that mouthful is that Bowman's Brook ceramics were initially identified at this site, defined, their attributes recorded, their time periods identified, and then since then, Bowman's Brook sherds have been found at many, many, many other sites uh, throughout the New York City metropolitan area and going up the, the Hudson Valley. So uh, the Wilkins is an important site, if for no other reason, that it represents the first site and the type site for Bowman's Brook phase ceramics. These show just two types of projectile points uh, that were found at Wilkins. Uh, these also give you uh, some indication of the time span that the site was occupied from. On the left is what's known as a Lavana projectile point. Lavanas really are true arrow points. The other ones are, are either knives or spear points. Uh, the Lavana represents the first introduction of bow and arrow technology in the southeastern New York area, which dates to about 800 to 900 AD or so. That's when bow and arrow uh, first come into this area. Before that, 
uh, it, hunting was done with uh, with spears or atlatls or uh, or other other penetrating tools. Uh, so here you have two one Lavana point dating from about eight somewhere between 800 and 1200 AD, and on the right uh, you have what's known as a Brewerton side notch point which goes back to about 6,000 to 3,000 BC. That's this time span that that point was generally made. So, you know, again, it shows a lot of different time periods and cultures that were using the Wilkins site. So it must have been, you know, a very good location to make a, make a living like that. This slide just shows you some other projectile points in the time periods represented by them. Uh, the Bear Island, a fairly common point uh, during the period of about uh, 3000 to 1500 uh, BC. Uh, then you have other tools that were found at Wilkins, such as the Chert, um, the Chert blade scraper, which was uh, used for cutting and for cleaning hides or cleaning bone or other utilitarian tasks. And then on the right, you just have a, um, a undecorated ceramic, which is really hard to date because it doesn't have those, uh, those attributes like we spoke about, which can be defined to particular periods. It's undecorated. All you can say is that it's somehow associated with the East River tradition and then would fit somewhere between 800 and 1400 AD, um, give or take. And again, that's consistent with the other pottery found at this site. Here you just find some other tools uh, that were found at the Wilkins site. Uh, these are scraping tools, cutting tools, um, other types of activities um, that would have been done. Uh, it represents and shows that there was processing activities occurring at the site, the scrapers, processing hides, processing meats off of bone, uh, cutting activities, uh, butchering, making clothing, um, making uh, various sorts of maintenance onto tools that were done there. So it just shows an increase in the variety of activities that occurred at the site. It also shows where some of these resources were gathered from. The quartz um, obviously has gotten locally in the, in the glacial sands and the, and the glacial deposits that are found throughout Staten Island. But on the left-hand side, some of those cherts, tools, bifaces, and that one uh, cutting implement, chert flake, on the right side, those items are not locally derived. They come from up the Hudson Valley in what is today Green County. So it just reflects that there was some sort of trading activities uh, going on uh, between the, these Long Island natives and other Native American groups you know, a couple hundred miles or so away to the north. This ovoid sandstone tool is also a uh, scraper. It's also generally called a, a deflesher or flesher tool, but but its main purpose was for scraping. Uh, you can see the, the one uh, surface r upper right on the oval there it shows some flaking, some damage, some crushing, various types of use damage, which actually is for this tool is more characteristic. The kind of damage is more characteristic with woodworking damage than it is with scraping something soft like fats off of hides or so. So again, it just shows the kinds of activities and diversities uh, that probably were occurring at Wilkins. Again, another uh, projectile point from the, the site. Uh, most of the points, interestingly, that we find uh, were broken at the tip. Uh, that could mean that they were intentionally left behind because 
you know, their use life seems to have been, you know, ended, so to speak. But uh, yes, yeah, these tools could have been, you know, reworked into other types of tools, uh, which I'll show you, show you an example of in a in a listen uh, at a little time. Um, but you know, again, just generally, this gives you another period of occupation at Wilkins, uh, ranging from about 3500 to about 2000 BC, sometime during that time span. Here is a Lamoka point from the from the winged base down, a Middle Archaic type dating from about 5500 BC to about 400, excuse me, to about 4000 BC. Uh, the projectile point itself uh, would have been more elongated, coming up at a more gradual angle, but apparently the tool broke for whatever reason, and it was reworked. Rechipped the blade area was rechipped into another kind of tool, smaller, um, but with a more sharper pointed tip. And if you look at the tip, you can see that there's <clears throat> the kinds of damage and the kinds of use indications are there on there that suggest that it was used as a graver, that it was used to incise bone, used to incise pottery, uh, used to maybe produce scarification, you know, on the, on the human body like that. So um, it really shows that many of the tool types, particularly the projectile point types, uh, could have been remodified, reworked into tools of a different, uh, a different fashion. And now for me, one of the more exciting uh, artifacts recovered from the Wilkins site, uh, which I briefly mentioned to you before. Uh, this is a fluted point. Uh, fluting is certainly not as dramatic or as, uh, as elongated as on that uh, pristine specimen I showed you earlier, but it's fluted nonetheless. And the context that it came from suggests, uh, you know, earlier than archaic, which would make it into a Paleo-Indian uh, kind of artifact. Um, you can see the fluting on the, on the base. Uh, you can see the concavity on the shape of the blade at the bottom. Uh, you can see the chipping on both sides of the artifact. Uh, it probably had broke once and was resharpened into something a little bit smaller, but then it, it broke again and um, its use was, was finished and it was discarded or otherwise lost at the Wilkins site. Two interesting things about this. Uh, one was that you see that fracture mark on the upper left. That fracture is uh, referred to generally as a transverse fracture, and it's most likely the result of some impact fracture, impact event. Uh, what it impact is um, unknown, obviously. Uh, it could have been from hitting an animal or so, uh, hitting a bone on the animal, missing the animal and striking a rock, uh, dropping it and, and breaking it back at the site itself. Uh, you know, there, there's many scenarios, but it just shows uh, some fracture and damage as a result of use. Now, the other thing is that the shirt that it was made from looks like something that's called Coxsackie or Normanskill shirt, which is found up in green county which i had mentioned previously so again this suggests that there was some you know fairly long distance trade that was being done by native americans uh, in the uh, college point north shore of long island area with those native americans up in uh, in green county and now this interaction could have been between two you know, separate groups that were trading indirectly with each other, or it could just represent uh, the New, New York City area, Paleo Indians, uh, you know, migrating seasonally up to the Chert, the lithic resource in Greene County to collect raw materials and come, you know, come back down south as the, uh, the season changed. So, you know, take your pick. There's not enough evidence out there to really say which scenario is uh, is correct, but we just do know that um, that this was associated with like Paleo Indian 
culture and that it it documents their activities on the North Shore of Long Island. This final slide I will show you briefly uh, shows Native Americans in various canoes and other watercraft uh, going up the East River, excuse me, going up the Hudson River. Uh, in the background is Fort Amsterdam, the Dutch Fort Amsterdam. Uh, this image is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, representations of Native Americans in the New York City area during the contact period. It dates to the 1630s. There's a number of these images from various times, but the earliest one dates to the 1630s uh, like that. Um, what you see in the background is parts of Brooklyn. Uh, you can see the high ground in Brooklyn, which represents what is today known as Brooklyn Heights, which as I had mentioned to you earlier, that Brooklyn Heights is part of the glacial moraine that represents the southwardmost extent of the glacial ice sheet during the last maximum of the Wisconsin glaciation between 18 and 20,000 years or so ago. So I hope this gave you some idea of uh, Native American cultures in the North Shore, Long Island area and in College Point. Uh, there are a number of sites that have been found. Most of them have been disturbed by modern day development, uh, recent activities and really activities going back 100 years as as Queens was uh, was developed. So just remember archaeological sites are a finite resource. They're they're limited. Uh, they do represent the whole period of time that um, human activity occurred on, on the North Shore of Long Island. During the last period, during the contact period, the Native American groups that would have inhabited uh, Long Island in the College Point area were part of what are known as the Matinecock. Uh, the Matinecock still have a presence in the area. You can still see their websites. You can go to some of their activities, seasonal activities that they have, which they publicize uh, for various locations on uh, Long Island. The Poppenhausen Institute has hosted uh, the Matinecock for various uh, activities and various talks and presentation, and they have a lot to say about their own culture and their own experience uh, in, um, in Euro-American and American history. Uh, the Poppenhausen Institute also I would encourage you to go visit because they have on display many artifacts uh, that were found from archaeological excavations in the area, um, both pre-contact artifacts and contact period artifacts associated with the Matinecock and other groups. So it would be well worth your while to spend a couple hours uh, going to the Poppenhaus Institute and seeing what they have to offer and to keep your ear to the Poppenhausen Institute's website to see when other uh, Native American culture talks will be given or when other podcasts dealing with um, Native American and European and American culture in the College Point area are developed. So I thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please just email uh, the Poppenhaus Institute and they will forward the emails to me and I'd be happy to, uh, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your time.